Hello, this is Lance Wolf, and this is Iron Wolf Productions, and this is the Magnesium Bow Rifle. Uh, this started in 1988 before I actually had a novel, and when I decided to build the gun, I used these parts here, basically two of each of these toy blasters, to create the profile I wanted. And it basically just started with figuring out how I was going to cut the guns up and mount them together and then the part I cut off the back I could then cannibalize off the part I cut to have an added part on the back and then using this gun cut creatively because I wanted to generate two rifles, two profiles based on the guns that I wanted to do for my novel uh, and these designs came out of a, a concept I did in 1988 uh, so all I had to do now was put a wooden dowel uh, in the gun barrel so they would line up perfectly and then everything was screwed together with sheet metal screws I actually didn't use any glue then cannibalized the tripod to get this clip so I could mount it on the scope so I could mount the scope every, anywhere I wanted on the model and then once these were assembled and screwed together this would give me the basis to generate these profiles which is a rifle that had a bow on it just like a, a bow and arrow which the concept was to generate a shield uh, that the gun fired something so hot that a shield needed to be deployed. And so, out of that, for this part of this build, was to now create these bows to match all the elements that I wanted. And being fortunate enough to have parts that go back 20 years in these bins and donated parts and toys from friends, I think everyone thinks I need parts, uh, to do this. And then having um, a profile that I created on the laptop uh, of these Nerf guns put together. I use Nerf guns because studios a lot of times will use Nerf guns to generate inexpensive props just repainted. But here I used cabinet screws and again no glue was used here just bolting it together and the bolts would actually give the uh, would do the create the artifacts that I wanted on the bows. I wanted something to look like spark plugs sticking out of this bow that would generate a shield. Now, yes, the bow does interfere with the scope, but I have an explanation how that works because I didn't want to do a crossbow. I thought a crossbow had been done before. And again, this was a concept that went back to 1988, long before my novel was done. When I came up with my novel in 92, uh, I had this to draw on. And that's where the, my novel got its name from. But uh, every morning, uh, I had to back the car out and set up in the garage because cutting and drilling uh, would put the kind of parts on the floor in my studio. Plus, I was also in the middle of doing another model, and I was doing kind of two things at once. So I had to turn the garage into a makeshift studio every day. Uh, there's the leftover parts after I got done putting uh, all those together. And then I needed plastic parts and little bits of pieces uh, to generate these extra parts. Uh, here's taking the little slot thing to put on the scope and then you know every day set up uh, get the parts I need and here I'm getting ready to put two of the uh, magazines together and basically no glue was hardly used at this point. I basically just drilled some pilot holes put a nail in to hold everything in place and then drilled uh, sheet metal screws in and this helped uh, you know, give me one. Now, first of all, the garage was freezing in January, so there's my biker jacket, good old trusty biker jacket, because it was freezing in the garage. And every day, I'd go out there and just freeze while I was putting this uh, uh, together. Uh, but uh, again, I had to use a nail to hold uh, the pilot holes together so the thing didn't shift all over the place. And again, at this point, I still haven't used any glue. The whole thing was just put together with bolts and screws, and that really added to the utilitarian look of it. You know, I wanted spark plugs to look like they were sticking out of these bows that would generate a shield. And at first, I wanted to have them spring-loaded. And I had enough model parts, as you can see here, from all the leftover. I could have done it, but then I thought, actually, uh, that could maybe fail in the battlefield. And I thought, perhaps, uh, something that we would actually open and close uh, like the way you deploy a, a tripod on a gun was how they should work and lock into place. So now the problem is to keep it from falling open, uh, I needed uh, a door hinge. And again, just going back to cabinet hinges and creatively coming up with little plastic parts that fit the right direction, manufacturing some pieces so I could bolt this in the right angle uh, so it would then click to the bottom of one of the bow arms. And uh, I wanted to have the whole thing to have this kind of harpoon look to it. Uh, but uh, there I had these great bolts sticking through and it just added uh, to the look of what I wanted to be these shield generators and those little plastic caps on the screws were parts off of a Gundam model which I found perfect to cover up the screws and it gave me the emitter look I wanted 
uh, these cabinet hinges allowed the arms once open to lock into place and it gave me the profile I wanted for these rifles uh, that my uh, graphic novel is named after and uh, there are only two of them and the concept is they fire magnesium rounds so hot and powerful uh, that it would burn anyone using it so they have to have these shield emitters deployed and the concept here was uh, that uh, yes it would interfere with the scope but if I did it right the scope would be able to peer right over the top of one of the bows and the concept would be that it would have targeting recognition software in the gun and I just needed two buttons to denote two buttons on it to turn it on and off and then a button on the trigger or the handle to tag the target to you know, select your, your uh, target profile and then after that you can open the bows up and then a red light in the scope tells you when you're on target so it was you know that was the only time you would need your scope so that was kind of the thought process that went into the gun now covering up uh, logos on the guns instead of sanding them off I decided it would be an opportunity to just put little panels uh, to kind of match uh, other types of panels that I've done on other models and it also would give me a place to mount a name or other things that I wanted and again, uh, that's the only time glue was used in, in this uh, approach, uh, just covering up the panels. And again, this was done each day. I came out and did a little work uh, while I was doing other things. And then used, I found putting these panels on everything really helped add to the gun's look. Uh, the screws, I actually added more screws just for looks. I wanted that utilitarian look. Now, most Nerf mods, people fill the holes in. I Again, I'm doing this fast and quick for a production-ready prop, and I wasn't going to bother going that extra route for things that you might not see. Uh, here, just adding uh, matte core board to cover up some of the you know, damage to cutting the model in, in pieces, or cutting the gun in pieces to cover up certain parts, certain holes, and other places leaving uh, parts, you know, that didn't need to fill that gap in the, that immediately. And uh, it really worked very well. And then I found these great hinges off one of my old portfolios to figure out where I was gonna hang the straps on these guns and found that the best way was hanging the straps on the side of the guns because of the bows. It just gave the gun a great way to, to hang it on your body. And it gave me the profiles for these rifles, these sci-fi rifles with these giant shield emitters that fold up and lock into place. And then I just mounted the clips end to end to make these ridiculously big clips. And now for painting, uh, it was very light sanding done. I've heard that paint doesn't adhere to them well. Uh, however, I found with the experience if you do one very light solid coat once uh, and then let it dry 24 hours, you can apply a second coat without any issue. And all I used was just a spray acrylic a primer uh, for the job. And uh, I only needed two colors because I realized really quick that the bows, I wanted to note heat on the bow, which meant I'd have to make the bows two colors. And I thought making the gun just a, a straight flat black and then add some gray to the bow limbs. That way I could come back and add a little bit of spray of black to give it um, that look of that they're, they're generating heat. And all these little extra screws sticking off of it just gave it the right look. It gave it like spark plugs sticking out of it. And it was just utilizing bolts and screws to put everything together. And like I said, very little glue. And that's what led to these uh, great rifles. And again, uh, if you've seen Nerf mods before, uh, yeah, this is not your typical Nerf mod. These aren't for cosplay. These are just for camera-ready, quick props. Uh, they're non-functioning in that sense. That they're, you know, they're not modified Nerf guns for Nerf use. Or, or if it were a cosplay, you'd have to paint the tip of the, the barrel orange. These are made for a production prop. Uh, to look like a regular, you know, something you'd see in a movie, a hero prop. And uh, that's what went into these. And then all I had to do now was mask off and put the gray in on the bars. And that's why I didn't worry about the, when I hung it up painting, uh, worried about the end because I knew I'd be coming back spraying that gray. And then deciding whether or not I was going to make the screws look copper or silver uh, to show that these are actually shield emitters for a rifle. And uh, so that's what went into this, the sci-fi aspect of this. And I've, what gave me the idea, see, this is something I wish I had a 3D printer for, and I would have designed the guns that way. But it just, I don't have that, and this is being done on the cheap, and how could I make inexpensive props for the namesake of my novel? 
And uh, after seeing Terra Nova, uh, did a great job of just repurposing and repainting Nerf guns for the series. And another great sci-fi series on the Sci-Fi Channel was Defiant. And they just repurposed uh, some of the same guns I'm using and just repainted them. But I thought with adding all these extra parts and mashing two guns together, I would come up with an original looking rifle. And then every day they hung for 24 hours in between each paint job to uh, allow everything to set. And I didn't wind up with any issues there. Now getting ready to antique the gun. Uh, going into this, I decided early on that I wanted to have certain elements of it. I found when you leave things different, different tones, adds more realism. And these plastic toy scopes were uh, very glossy, so I thought I would paint the main part flat and leave the caps uh, gloss, and that would add kind of a more realistic look to it. And uh, when it comes to antiquing things, uh, here, like you said, I, I, which you can see here, I've painted the bullets, uh, the foam bullets, to just give them kind of a look. And I, the color theme of the, the rifle, I thought, would be uh, like a Black Widow. A Black Widow has very little red spots on it to really denote it, to make it look angry and mean. And I thought the rifle should be the same way, just little hints of red, uh, since the cap of the bullet was red. And uh, as I'm getting ready to antique everything, uh, I kept that in mind. So then I went through all these printouts that I have for other uh, models left over uh, to just, you know, utilize the same stuff so it's all from the same universe. And I thought the uh, the magazine should have little things denoting. Since I swapped two magazines together, top and bottom, it reversed uh, how you would put them in, and I had to denote some way so you'd know what direction the magazine was going to uh, install. And so I thought little marks to denote danger, you know, so the arrow, arrows to give clues and like what, what type of magazine it is or, or power source. And so these little teeny touches just add little types of realism to it. Uh, and then while antiquing, again, my favorite way to antique things uh, is to use a toothpick or a wooden chopstick and then a very stiff brush to, after you've applied that to go over it and add even finer detail. Uh, but I don't care for using a painting pen. I feel it just adds to, uh, it doesn't add realism to me. It seems too forced. Uh, a more natural scratch is when you're rubbing it with a, a chopstick or a toothbrush, or pardon me, toothbrush, toothpick. Uh, it gives you uh, a very natural looking scratch. But then again, you really here want to make sure that you don't overdo it. You know, you only do it on the edges that you think might uh, wind up with wear. Uh, to do it too much, uh, then it looks used and abused. I mean, no one's going to be dropping a, a magazine clap in the dirt. So the only sc marring on it, would, I would assume, come out of wearing it, bumping into a belt or something, you know, when you're hanging it on a wall or an ammo box. So I tried to be very minimal on the scratches and just scratches where you'd assume it would be rubbing up against a belt. And then again, some quick printouts to show that the, each clip has a top and a bottom to it. It's just two clips ma mashed together to come up with all these giant clips that I wanted to come up with. And uh, trying to put these little marks just to denote a little functionality to them, uh, which you know I thought would really add to the look of it. And then again, keeping the color scheme red and uh, black, I thought would give it that neat, kind of like a, a deadly look like what you'd see on a, uh, like a Black Widow Spider. Now here doing the marring up on the uh, scopes. Again, you have to really think where the scratches are actually going to be hitting. You know, there wouldn't be anything on the bottom of it unless something were constantly hitting it. So my thought was the type of wear you'd have would be from rubbing up against a body or uh, something like that, not laying in the dirt. And so, again, you have to be very minimal where you're going to put your scratches or if you're going to put a major scratch. And I find coming back with a paintbrush, you can make a really case of wear, like something is constantly rubbing this one side an awful lot. And if you put it in the most creative place, uh, it'll then start looking uh, uh, right. And so then it came to, I wanted to put the name of the gun, since the graphic novel is named after this gun, I thought it was very important that the name of the gun would match the logo. And so I put dash one or dash two for the two different types of guns there were. And you know, one is the, uh, Type 1 is the assault rifle, and the Type 2 is a longbow uh, tactical assault rifle. And the, the concept is that these two rifles are all that's used by this one faction. And one of them is to shoot these ridiculously high-powered magnesium rounds where if you don't have the shields deployed, you'll be burned. 
uh, by the, the back of uh, the blast of shooting these guns. And it was also part of the story, you know, and without giving too much away of the story, what I'm doing here is I have a graphic novel and I'm, I'm uh, teasing, uh, as I'm documenting all the artwork and creating this graphic novel, all this material as well as these videos are going into document and go into the, the director's guide for this, for this novel. And uh, without giving away too much of the story, I'm showing, I'm documenting the artwork and you get to see a little behind the scenes. And while I'm generating uh, these things that I need for my graphic novel, uh, you know, I'm hoping to, to share some techniques and things that went into it. Uh, here I wound up, I couldn't get the top thing to lock, so any raising would have interfered too much with the scope. So I came up with just putting some Velcro uh, something you really couldn't see, but it held locked the top together. And then, since the original artwork had a little extra on one of the scopes, uh, I had this great light, and all I had to do was come up with a way to bolt the light on it using a clip. So I had one of these great lights that has a clip that would clip on your shirt. So all I had to do was find a way to mount the clip on the scope, and this really gave the model a, a unique look. Uh, because these scopes are like laser targeting scopes, uh, not only would you be looking through them on the side, but you could also mount them on the side of the gun to create like a flashlight uh, kind of thing, or, you know, a, a way to target. Uh, they weren't technically, you know, it's trying to add concepts to these rifles to having, you know, targeting software built into them. Uh, the kind of same kind of concept, when you hold up a phone, it puts a, a square over a face. Uh, that's, you know, tracking software. And that's what these guns kind of futuristically have. But uh, so that's what's going into this. I had to come up with some quick props that were inexpensive uh, and then adding little elements here to, to create more realism here. Secondly, it was very cold, so I had to use a, a hair dryer for some of the paint. Otherwise, it just wouldn't it wouldn't dry and then I let it dry overnight. Literally everything uh, because it's a Nerf gun and because of that type of plastic without sanding it. The only way is to literally let it dry overnight. Uh, otherwise, you might have some cracking issues. But then I had to come up with two buttons on the gun, and I thought I'd have to add some, but luckily uh, this Nerf gun already had a couple of buttons placed in the right places uh, for parts, that, which you'll see uh, at the end of this video. I've created a, a sort of diagram of what these rifles do, and there's actually a, a use for every part on it. Now, as you're going through antiquing, I've never really been too happy with uh, weathering powders. Uh, again, I'm always doing things on the cheap, exactly what I have. I never have everything I need. And so you just learn to make do with what you have. Now here, I'm making any touch-ups, and, and I'm using Tamiya paint. And I have a set, as you can see there on the table there, that's my little set of Tamiya paints that goes on. Pretty much I use the same stuff on everything, and I get the looks I want. And uh, here, again, uh, that is pewter. And it's uh, just pewter paint. And as I'm adding the details and scratches, I'm actually trying to be very thoughtful where the scratches are going to denote use. I'm not putting that much scratch down the center of the rifle because then that would mean you've been laying it on the ground or, or laying it up against something that the only scratches would be from wear, from carrying it, from bumping it into things uh, or from rubbing on the body. So that meant that would define the kind of scratches that would go on it. And I either use Tamiya uh, aluminum paint or uh, this odd brand of, of pewter paint and, and to do it. Now normally it's just a brush, a stiff brush, uh, a toothpick or a chopstick to get the look I want. Here I tested this on this one side of the gun and tried something new. Uh, I took a, a sanding sponge and covered it with paint and thought that would give an interesting look. But it actually didn't. It actually made it too scratchy and it didn't give me the control I needed. Uh, but to make natural scratches, I find using a toothpick or a, uh, or a chopstick gives you a very realistic natural scratch. Uh, a painting pen, I mean, you're welcome to try that. I've seen other uh, great sites that make props do great jobs with painting pens, but I just never could found for me that it worked as well as I wanted. Um, and then the last thing to do to come back is when you're done with all your scratches is to water down uh, some Tamiya paint and then go back over some of the scratches. That gives you that kind of oil soiled look, a uh, stained look. And that's all I had to do then. And that also meant that I'd have to go over each one of those red buttons with that same technique to really bring them to life. And again here, um, I had to add gray to the bow arms because I wanted to note this thing generates heat. And if the whole thing was black, it just wouldn't work. 
but again, I didn't want to add too much color to the gun. Uh, I'm actually not a big fan of uh, space guns that are way too colored and, and way too much. You know, this is war. Uh, they wouldn't be painted fancy. Uh, I find in science fiction things get overdone a little. Uh, to me, that the laws of Parsono means the simplest is the, is the better way to go. And to have a gun super overpainted, sci-fi gun, it looks great, it's just not for me. I, I look at that as being something from uh, an economy that can really pull it, put something out. And here, this is just a, a, a tool that is used on a regular basis. It's marred up from wear, but not abused. And uh, the function it serves, and it's got a little kind of a burn mark there on the edge. And that's what went into this. And then here they are, uh, the little bits of red on the triggers and um, and uh, uh, the, the magazines to give the whole thing to bring it all together color scheme wise. And then all I'm coming back to here do, the last thing to do is to kind of oil it up a little, give it kind of a more military use, uh, is to take a Tamiya paint and water it way down. I have one jar of Tamiya that's practically empty and I just squirt a little water in it and it gives me just the right amount of gray. Now, uh, I've seen other sites use uh, weathering powders. Uh, you know, I'm not knocking what anyone else does. There's so many uh, more amazing prop builders uh, online than this. Uh, this is just what I'm doing to suit me. Uh, it's for a quick prop uh, for an upcoming video where I wanna, the best way to, to do the director's guide uh, was to build these quick nerf mods uh, and really kit bash them to get the look I wanted because Again, a lot of times when you're doing projects, you just aren't going to have everything you need. And it's quite simple. The best way to go uh, is to uh, do any way you can do to achieve a artwork, anything short of a criminal act to achieve the goal you want. And since I didn't have a 3D printer, this is the way I had to go. Well, here is the upcoming in-depth look where you get to see the weathering and scratching done very in-depthly. Uh, Unfortunately, I think this is actually this part coming up. It's about seven minutes long. It's a little too long. Uh, but it was really hard because I really wanted to show the rifles and all the weathering techniques. And uh, I tried to shoot it as many different ways as possible so you could see every little scratch and ding because a lot went into the, all those little pieces uh, of weathering to try to make these as, you know, uh, I want to make these look as real uh, as possible, as, you know, and with a little bits of black watered down to stain up certain parts. And you go back over the silver the same way. That's what gives it that kind of greasy look without, uh, uh, you know, weathering powders. Now, again, uh, you know, I, I don't use them because I just don't have them. <laughs> and again, again, I'm doing these things on the cheap. Uh, the, the challenge I have is to take the junk that's in my garage and mash it together to come as close to the goal of uh, one of my designs for my graphic novel. And this was one of those where this thing sat for, oh Christ, years, because I really wanted to do it in 3D printing. But it just wasn't the budget. I'm just never going to have a 3D printer at this point. And so the best way to go was to follow the same way other sci-fi projects have done, where they've just repurposed and repainted Nerf guns to get a nice camera-ready production prop. And I was very happy how these rifles came out. Uh, the bows work exactly the way they're supposed to look uh, for the graphic novel. Uh, they suit the purpose, and uh, they will be in an upcoming video where I'll be showing uh, what some of the guards look for my graphic novel. And again, this is all going towards generating for a director's guide for my novel that was created back in 1992. But these original concepts came from a 1988 concept where at the time I was just coming up with a sci-fi gun and thought, what if it would be based on a, on a crossbow, but not a bow, but a bow and arrow. And I thought, you know, it's gonna interfere with the scope, but if I did it creatively, and because of a nice futuristic sci-fi excuse as to, well, no, you only use the scope to paint your target, and then once you open up your bows, it automatically selects your target, so you don't need to look through the crossbow anymore. And so coming up with that good sci-fi excuse <laughs> allowed me to come up with this gun. And since this Nerf gun already had those two little buttons on it and the little button on the on the uh, grip. I thought this is perfect. And uh, again, these parts were sitting in my garage. Uh, they were donated Nerf guns, and I used two of each of these Nerf guns to generate these rifles uh, for my graphic novel. Uh, I hope you enjoy them. I hope the techniques I've talked about 
are helpful. Uh, where you place scratches, also in detailing like the little elements of the little red, things that I think add to a, a kind of a totalitarian look to it, uh, an industrial design. Uh, the gun, I want it to look like one was mashed together with another gun. And the concept would be this, you know, this society, when you're doing things with the laws of parsimony, uh, both philosophically and economically, you want to think in your story, uh, if this is the only gun this faction is using, do they have enough of them? Uh, are they repurposed weapons? Uh, that's why two of the guns similarly look the same. Uh, it's the same trigger assembly, it's just one takes a different clip. Uh, that shoots. Uh, one has a 9-9 nine, nine clip, another has an 18-18 18, 18 clip. Uh, and I thought for the, the tactical rifle, it would have a smaller uh, round as opposed to the one that has a big devastating uh, assault rifle round. And, uh, you know, utilizing parts from other models, uh, other little quick paper decals, uh, leftovers, uh, repurposing them uh, really gives you a, an interesting look. Uh, you know, you're, without think if they're not there, you notice them. If they're not there, you think, okay, well, you know, it, it really helps to the believability. And then leaving parts too tough. Gloss and uh, flat really change the look of something. Uh, so I find that to be what really brought the gun together was the scopes having the different tones and then adding a little bit of gray on the bars. And then I wound up not painting the little uh, bolts sticking out of the bows copper, or I originally was going to do copper or silver like a spark plug. Uh, but it just overdid it, and, and that's what I mean, where you have to really think about not overdoing scratches, uh, not overdoing color. Uh, I feel a lot of sci-fi rifles that look amazing, and again, I'm not knocking other people's work. It's just, it's not for the universe I've created. I feel sometimes an overuse of color uh, takes away a believability. Uh, this is a functioning uh, space rifle, you know, it's, it's an assault rifle for a uh, science fiction. And does it require to be all fancy colored? You know, technically, when you look at most rifles in the real world, uh, they're very little color to, to most assault rifles. Uh, and I thought that's what would really pull this together and make it realistic. And uh, that's everything that went into this. And at the end here, uh, the funnier part is I, I wanted to show the scale of the rifles by, by standing in and holding the rifles. Uh, I'm quite a large fellow. And, uh, of course, uh, you know, when you're in front of the camera, you don't realize that you get a little, uh, uh, you, you know, you're taken back. Uh, I actually, even though I put all these little arrows and diagrams to show which way uh, the clips went in, I still, because the camera was on, my brain went dead, and I couldn't figure out which way to put my own clip in. And so, you know, once I got it going, and then I couldn't get it in. With every other test, it went in perfect. And of course, this time didn't, so I wasn't about to reshoot that. And uh, I wanted to show how the uh, scope could place anywhere. Uh, but that's a little what went into this. And then at the end of this video, you'll see diagrams of all the fancy stuff explaining how these guns work. And I hope you like this video. I hope it wasn't too long, but I really wanted to, to document these rifles. And I based all this uh, from a concept in 1988, uh, because technically my graphic novel grew out of the artwork I did. Uh, the formula for it was I came up with all these great concepts, great characters and vehicles, and then had to create a world for them to be in. And that's why uh, <laughs> this project was named after this rifle, because at the time I didn't know what to call it. So, but it worked out perfectly uh, by naming it after the gun, uh, and I finally got to build these rifles uh, that are based on the namesake of my graphic novel. And I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, I put a lot into it, and uh, again, this is teasing a director's guide that's coming up. Uh, I've only got a couple more models to show uh, before I start working on uh, other projects, uh, but I hope you enjoyed this video. My name is Lance Wolf. Thank you so very much for watching this. And of course, I have my back to the camera. I don't know what I was thinking <laughs> doing that scene. But again, thank you very much and uh, enjoy the rifle diagrams that are at the end of this video. Thank you again and thank you for indulging me. I'm Lance Wolf.